It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Robert J. Whitman, who's the founder and CEO of Forward Science. He received both his bachelor's and master's degrees in biomedical engineering from Tulane University and began his career as a clinical engineer at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where his focus was developing advanced technology for early detection of cervical cancer. Fueled by a passion for early cancer diagnosis, Robert then went to work in research and development at Remicom, where he worked on creating cancer screening products utilizing fluorescent technology licensed from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Finally, in 2012, Robert launched Forward Science with fellow former engineer Brian M. Piccolo with the goal of developing innovative technologies for clinicians to advance oral cancer screening procedures. In addition to his role as CEO, Robert also serves as an advisor to startup medical technology companies on product development strategies at the Texas Medical Center and often speaks nationally on the topic of oral cancer and early discovery. Uh, my gosh, I think um, what Mark S. Chambers, uh, the Department of Head and Neck Surgery at uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Center doing is just mind boggling. And you went to Tulane. Congratulations on getting a degree while living in New Orleans, home of Bourbon Street, where I was at last weekend with three of my four sons, and I don't know how. Why are you not an alcoholic? You should, you, you should have never gone to class. What happened? You know, I think uh, discipline early on gets you, you. You get a good taste at such an early age that you get through that. So most people start drinking in college, but you know, I won't admit this to my parents all the time, but. We got a much earlier start than the average person, if you will. And Tulane, I mean, it's consistently ranked among the top 50 universities in the nation. And the reason I asked you to be on the show, you did not ask me, is because I have never understood the difference between oral cancer and cervical cancer. I mean, you turn that patient upside down, it's cervical cancer, insurance pays, they have all these tests, they have regular screenings. It's like, duh. And then you turn that human over and you look at the mouth, the same technology, the same fluorescence. Delta Dental doesn't pay for the exams. Um, the, the tests aren't screened. You don't have CNN yelling all the time, get your annual screening. And it's like 50,000 Americans die from oral cancer each year. What What is going on? Why, why is this still crazy? Yeah, it's, it's tough. I mean, we started our career at MD Anderson Cancer Center doing cervical cancer research. And early on, you know, the numbers were exactly where oral cancer numbers are. We're at 40, 50,000 cases. And in, you know, the 90s, the past smear came out and these trends, uh, excuse me, the 50s, the past smear came out, these trends, you know, plummeted. So you went from 50,000 cases to 12,000 now, but- For cervical, that, for cervical? For cervical cancer. Okay. So you went from 50-ish thousand down to 12,000 and, you know, some- some people talk about the vaccine playing a role in that, and maybe so because time's passed enough now, but it's really because of annual screenings were so regimented for females getting an annual pap smear. And yes, the elephant in the room is, of course, females are going to get an annual pap smear if the insurance pays for it. So if I'm going to go to my annual OBGYN, and by no means are you and I getting a pap smear, so we'll, we'll throw that out the window now, but for, for women that are getting annual pap smear, we're finding cervical cancer so early now that's why the rates have plummeted. So it's and not just that it's going away. It's the fact that we're finding it so early that it never metastasized into cancer and the HPV is being removed. And now we're, we're having much longer prognosis for these females. And what year was the peak of cervical cancer, 50,000, when it started to? This is in, in the mid 50s, 1950s is when the CDC came out and said, we have to do something about this. And this is kind of what we educate dentistry on is, you know, the annual pap smear changed the game on cervical cancer. It forced women to go get, every year, a preventative screening test. So if the CDC pays for it, insurance pays for it, in theory, it's a great test, right? Right. It's, it's only 50% accurate scientifically. Now, we want that test that's 90% accurate, 100% accurate. And the challenge is we want to test that just tests way more advanced than right now. Back in the day, it was colposcopes, and it was looking so the accuracy for pap smears was actually pretty low. It was the fact that cervical cancer was getting paid by insurance and females were getting educated properly to get screenings. Okay, so, you know, how many people are dying of oral cancer? Um, is it still about 50,000? So yeah, we're, we're getting 53,000 cases here in the U.S. diagnosed and we're getting about 10,000 die. That's just the U.S. You know, you throw in third world countries and places like India where 40% of all cancer is oral cancer, 
but now you're at you know a top ten cancer where it's you know it's it's a third of the deaths are from cancer are related to oral cancer. So to your point, I mean the issue is this is the only cancer and and again when you look at statistics, the first book that we ever read in engineering school was how to lie with statistics. So I challenge every stat that we were ever told. Oral cancer is the only cancer in the past 16 years that's risen every single year in incidence rate. We got to do something, right? I mean, there's something that we're doing wrong in the United States of America, and nobody wants to talk about it. Um, so, you know, our issue is that incidence is rising, but also survival rate hasn't gotten better. So you put those two things together, and now you have, you know, one in every hour American dies of oral cancer, and it hasn't changed in two or three decades. Okay, so so what why what is the difference between a female cervical cancer in viewed in society versus oral cancer? And um, I always felt that some of it has to do with if you got your cancer from being a bad boy, um, there's less money. Like, like lung cancer, lung cancer is the biggest biggest one. It dwarfs everybody, but it doesn't get the uh, the most money, the most research because everybody's like, well, you should have not smoked. Um, it's your fault. It's yourself. You know, one of the biggest hurdles that we face is that stigma. You know, and, and you look at you look at what Susan Coleman's done for breast cancer awareness. It's remarkable that you look and you see the color pink and you associate it with breast cancer. And you have walks and events. The problem is, you know, with oral cancer, almost every major cause is self-induced. Whether it's tobacco and alcohol related or HPV, everybody looks at it as I did it to myself. So if I do, you know, for one, we're not living long enough to share our story. And if some way we are, nobody shares it. You know, Tony Gwynn is one of the best hitters ever to play baseball, and he died at 56 years old from excessive tobacco use. Nobody in the Major League Baseball is talking about it. Why? I mean, you had the option, the opportunity to educate and screen patients regularly that are at the highest risk. It's just taboo, right? I mean, that's why we do marketing a little differently. We have sex, drugs, and old cancer everywhere you can find because if we're not addressing the HPV issue, then who is? And you know, we're not going to change these trends. Well, Kyle, we just got the name of this podcast. It's Sex, Drugs, and Oral Cancer by Robert <laughs> Whitman. I mean, who's not going to click into Sex, Drugs, and Oral Cancer? I mean, they'll see that and think, well, I hope they left a number. Is there some uh, is there a website I can go to? So let, let's start with that. Um, sure. What is... Um, well, latest statistic on oral cancer. You're so you're going um, just to summarize. It's one death per hour in the U.S. or world. It is. That's just the U.S. So you know we're we're getting the incidence rate is fifty three thousand cases this year alone. Uh, we're getting about ten diagnosed 000, or dead dead. Di that's diagnosed. Okay. Fifty three thousand diagnosed. We're going to get about ten thousand of that dying every year here in the U.S. Um, you know, 70 percent of those patients that are diagnosed are found in late stages. Because traditionally, when you see or, or feel a tumor, it's a secondary tumor that we find. So it's one death in the U.S. per hour. Correct. Per hour. Uh, 53,000 uh, cases diagnosed annually and 10,000 will die. Yep. And then worldwide, you get 127,000 deaths. And you know, that's a lot. Um, worldwide, how many? 127,000 oral cancer deaths every year. And that's with 274,000 cases. So you're seeing you know, half the population that's diagnosed with oral cancer die within five years. How many diagnosed worldwide? How many? 274,000. So the five-year survival rate worldwide is less than 30%. I mean, that's tough. World, uh, worldwide survival rate is what? Less than 30%. So, you know, we spend half of our time educating because you know, the dental industry does a very good job with education, but oral cancer is not one that, you know, it's a mandatory 12 hour credit every year. And, you know, we struggle with educating on the new trends and new factors because there is new technology that we can help change lives and it's just getting people to incorporate it into their everyday practice. So let, let's talk about your, uh, you have a famous lecture uh, called um, Sex, Drugs, and Oral Cancer. Um, what, what does that mean? Why did you add sex and drugs and oral cancer? Uh, those three things normally don't go together. Yeah, I mean, I think most of the time we think of it's marketing, right? So we throw the word sex in there and drugs and people want to listen, which is partially why we did it. Uh, realistically, it's because oral cancer is caused from you know, two major risk factors, 
tobacco and alcohol for the longest time, but now the sex comes in from sexually transmitted HPV. And, you know, you've talked about it. I've listened to all your, your podcasts of you've had a ton of educated people getting on and talking about oral pharyngeal cancer, HPV relationship, and, you know, it's tough. We're not, we're not fully comprehending right now where this is going to be within the next 10 years because this is just the start to what HPV is going to do for the oral cavity and oral pharynx specifically. Um, so we got a long way ahead of us, and I think education and early discovery is really the key to, to helping change these trends. Well, that, that's another one. I mean, um, um, well, first of all, on the HPV, um, yep. it's not just from kissing, though. I mean, it's not just from sex. It's from kissing and, um, well, just kissing in general. I mean, I don't want to just say oral sex, but can you transmit HPV, obviously, uh, by kissing? Yeah, I mean, you saw that recent dental in, dental article that came out that said where there's like, whenever you French kiss someone, there's so many bacteria and things getting swapped. Um, it is mainly from sexually transmitted, so it's it's typically oral sex, so we're seeing it stem from the cervix to the mouth, so we don't have to draw stick figures on how it gets from the cervix to the mouth, but that is how we're traditionally seeing it, but it also can be from sharing a drink after a loved one. Now, there's a reason that, that every time a woman's about to have a child, they get an annual pap smear. They get pap smears regularly. It's because if the mother has HPV, then the child is likely to get HPV too, and, and we got to be able to prevent against that early on. So it can be mother and child at birth, sharing a drink, and then the highest incidence is from sexual transmission. So um, do you think Michael Douglas played a big role in getting this out when um, he came out and he said, I got oral cancer, and it was from oral sex? And when the newspapers heard Michael Douglas say oral sex, I mean, they jumped on that to know tomorrow. What, what did you think of that, the whole Michael? Uh, I'm in New York walking down you know, Broadway, and there's a huge tabloid on the side that says, sex gave me cancer. And of course, you got to grab that. I don't know what that means, but we're in the cancer world. So I grab the article, and it's Michael Douglas telling the world that, you know, cunnilingus gave him oral cancer. And for the next month, cunnilingus was the most Googled word. It's, and I tell everybody, you're going to Google it. Don't Google it on a work computer, or don't Google it next to kids. It's cunnilingus is oral sex. He just tried to pretty up the, the way he got oral cancer from not just saying it blatantly. Um, he did a good job for a year about educating about oral cancer and how HPV relationship, but then... You know, his PR team told him to, to stop talking about it. And, you know, unfortunately, that's where we're at with oral cancer. You know, kind of your point earlier, people aren't getting above. And, and people like Michael Douglas have a great opportunity to share the world about oral cancer. And he did it for a year, but it, it makes him look bad. And he got more questions than he wanted. Uh, it made me uh, not want to kiss him anymore. I, uh, <laughs> I I absolutely stopped that dream. But, but you know, it's funny. We started this about, you know, okay, you turn uh, – someone stand on their hands and you look at the cervix and the whole world's behind you, the health insurance, everything. Um, the vaccine for HPV that we should, our patients be getting is Gardasil. And you, you open up the Gardasil9.com website and it's vaccine A for cervix and vaccine B for Gardasil. So, I mean, we're supposed to be a doctor of dental surgery, a physician of the mouth and all my MD friends, they're they're totally on top of cervical, and all my dentist homies, um, they, they they don't talk about this to patients. They don't give the vaccine. I'm in Arizona. I'm not even allowed to give a flu shot, let alone a vaccine for HPV. But I can go into Walgreens and have a pharmacy tech give me a flu shot. It's like, okay, my nine years of college, I can't do it. But a farm tech who looks like he's younger than any of my four children. Uh, I mean, so what would it, why, uh, what, what do you think of Gardasil 9? And again, it, it has to be some cultural taboo. Yeah, I think the part about healthcare that we're all trying to figure out is, you know, how do we have this integrated medicine from Dentistry is doing blood pressures, and you're doing so many things in the dental office. Well, let's be real. I'm going to go to my dentist every six months, and I, I don't know I don't know who my PCP is. I haven't been to a primary care physician in years because you typically don't do your annuals as much as people would like because people go in when they get sick. But dentistry should be be able to step up, and everybody's got their own rules and regulations they got to take care of, which puts a hurdle in it. Um, I think if you look at the vaccines, some people are pro or against vaccines or it's, it's everybody's personal choice, but you got to look at the risk versus the reward. And right now, the risk of oral cancer has been rising. And, you know, the reward for being able to get vaccinated from a disease that's been affecting a lot more patients is there. So it goes back to education and, 
to your point, it's, it's ease of use. And we can get people to be able to give these vaccines like a dental office. Then, yeah, I think more people would give it. People would give it. Um, but there's several threads on Dental Town discussing, you know, is it a personal choice? Is it a, a, is a vaccine? And, you know, and what I what I can't stand the most is um, when somebody asks an honest question, then society marginalizes them. Just stop doing that. Quit being, you know, you're not going to change someone's mind by bullying them and making them feel bad. You have to engage them. And there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, the dentists are up front that, um, that, um, they're concerned that you're right not to vaccine and then you bring your kid into my pediatric dental office and expose 30 kids and that makes the evening news. Um, so um, is this va- um, vaccine really a personal choice? Yeah, I mean, I think early on in Texas, it was created in Texas by MD Anderson and one of their affiliates and the governor at the time tried to mandate it. And, you know, here in the United States, if you get anything mandated, people get turned off. Whether you the vaccine was beneficial or not, when it comes out of the gates mandated, people fought back way, way too hard. And it started on the bad foot. So, you know, mandating vaccines, yeah, the challenge is if you, you know, now with vaccinations in schools, they're mandatory because all it takes is one kid not to be vaccinated to be in a school and everybody's sick. So, you know, it's tough. I I don't have a ton of experience with it, but as far as my kids, because I have a four and a half year old and an almost two year old, so we haven't had the conversations yet, but my wife's an ER nurse and you know, we believe in science. We believe in the medical industry and these vaccines work. You know, they're, they're out there for a reason. Um, uh, what what fact- I have found in, here in Phoenix, what if I'm able to change someone's mind is that um, they say, well, if you're vaccinated, you're not going to get it. What, what are you worried about? It's, you used to be worried about my kid. And, so they don't understand. I said, well, that's a great thought, but my kid or myself will still get the virus. And my body will have to go to war and it's going to be in a full front war before this vaccine kicks in, builds up my immune system. And yeah, I won't die from it because I got vaccinated, but I'll be coming home from war and I I don't want to go to war. And they're like, Oh, so, cause they just think, well, if you get a vaccine, you have this magic shield, the virus can't come in. So they don't understand virology. And um, so um. So let's just go go through it. Why is dentistry not screening for oral cancer? You know, I think there's a lot of factors that play a role with that. Um, you know, for one, anything insurance pays for, I think people are more likely to do. So if you want to talk about the elephant in the room, if we can get insurance companies on board, the issue with that, and again, I, I have no political issue with insurance companies, but I also, they don't take care of us and our screening. So the reason that insurance companies don't, cover our screenings or screenings with any adjunctive device is mainly because, and I've asked somebody high up at one of the insurance companies and he's swore to me, he'll deny this if, if, if I put him on the stand. So I won't give names, but said, Hey, why don't you guys cover oral cancer screening? You know, for, for us, cervical cancer gets covered because for every dollar you spend, you save $5 long-term, right? And that's the whole purpose of prevention for them. For every dollar you spend an oral cancer screening, you save the medical insurance company money. So why would the dental insurance pay two to $5 million in their premiums when it doesn't save them a dime? It saves the guy down the street the money. And unfortunately, that's the world we're in. And insurance dictates a lot of stuff. And, and you and I will probably agree that we shouldn't let it dictate things, but it does for patients. So a lot of our patients that get educated that insurance may or may not cover, and it's a simple fee for service, they do go ahead and get the screening. But for the offices that are insurance driven, Insurance, we don't expect to cover this in the near future because it's not saving that insurance company money. They run a for-profit business, and they're saving their counterpart down the street, the medical insurance company, that money. So that's the biggest reason. Uh, The other reasons are people don't want to talk about cancer. You know, I've heard a million times, I'd rather not talk about cancer. I got into dentistry to do cosmetic and to make patients feel better. You know, unfortunately, I think we have a responsibility to our patients that – you guys are the educating factor. You're the you're their clinicians now. You have to talk about everything that they need to know about. And oral cancer has been on the rise for a long time. Um, and I think the third and final challenge is technology. You know, it's not something that people learn about in dental school. It's not something that has been out there for 50, 60 years. We have advanced technology now that's not diagnostic, but we have to embrace it that it's just one of the tools that we have in our office. And part of what we try to offer is unlimited education so that when you do have a patient in the chair, 
and you have a lesion you're concerned about, call us. Let us help you. You're not on an island on your own. You're not going to call the oral pathologist that's going to give you his or her thoughts without even seeing the lesion. Let's have a discussion. Let's take some pictures. Let's do some diagnostics, and let's figure out what's the game plan for this patient. And I think knowing that you have somebody in your, on your side to help you through that process, and we have offices that are on board a lot more frequently, and we're seeing patients every day, because unfortunately it's not the 40-year-old smoker anymore. It's the 16-year-old that walks in the door that doesn't have any risk factors whatsoever. So um, let's um, finish the, the point on the dental insurance. Um, history repeats itself because the more things change, the more you're still a homo sapien. And as a homo sapien goes from smoke signals to the telegraph to the telephone, and the, the internet is only the telegraph uh, 2.0 or 3.0, but um, 1895 x-rays were discovered and it was in 1896 the next year that Charles Edmund Kells took the first dental x-ray and um, there was no, but nobody was using dental x-rays until 1954 when the first dental insurance company started um, in California. And then when they came out with their dental insurance for the Longshores um, and Club, of um, they were the um, um, shipping industry. Every container that came in and out of America went through the Longshoremen's Club. And that covered 100% for cleanings, exams, and x-rays. And America, like a domino, the whole, the, everybody bought an x-ray machine. So yeah. the fact is that um, what it should have could, it doesn't matter. Someone's got to pay for this. The patient um, has got to pay for it and or the dental insurance. So um, is the patient coming in and asking you for a flu shot and they'll pay you 10 bucks like they do at Walgreens? Or are they asking you for Gardasil 9? Uh, by Merkin Company and pay for that upon you know um, it, it it's it's a crazy mess. So so tell me specifically what are you doing? What what is Ford Science? I mean you've been on this for a long time. What are you doing um, to help this today? Like so I'm a dentist. Um, I saw patients a couple of days last week. You see some something you're suspicious about. What how are you changing that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first step that we wanted to do is we wanted to take current technology that's being used at the top cancer center in the nation and get it out to every single person in the world that can use it. So obviously the dental industry is who we need to focus on. Um, you guys are seeing patients across the board. So for us, we took technology, fluorescence technology that we utilize for both cervical cancer and oral cancer, along with upper and lower endoscopies in the lungs. So any mucosal cells in the body, we took that technology um, we incorporated it into an easy, user-friendly, simple device with no per patient costs. And we want every dentist and specifically every hygienist to have a device. And every time you see a patient, you screen them. It takes two minutes. It is not diagnostic. It's not going to just throw a red flag and say cancer is there. But it's just like your loops. If you see a lesion of interest, it's going to help you see it better. That's the purpose of it. So our device, Oral ID, has been on the market since 2013. Um, you know, we've been saving lives ever since. We have patients that are lesions that are found early that aren't even cancer yet. On early. what's it, what's this one called? Oral ID. Okay, oral ID. Okay. So oral ID has been on the market since 2013. Um, it's a simple, easy device. I mean, you can see how simple and easy it is. It's a simple light, and you shine a you shine a light on the patient's tissue. You wear a pair of glasses, and the glasses block out all the light coming out of the device. We only want to see the fluorescence from the tissue. And then you're able to see lesions much earlier. So here's one of our laminated sheets that we give to the dental office. And you can see lesions that are white light compared to fluorescence technology. It gives us the ability to see these lesions when they're stage one, stage zero. And that's the difference from a patient having 80% survival rate to a 40% survival rate. So that's our first step. You know, we launched the World ID. We thought that the device itself was going to change the market, but we then shortly realized you can't just launch a device and hope everybody uses it. You know, things things happen. You guys are busy. You're running a practice. There's new technology every year. So what we did was we said, hey, let us do a program. Let's let's give you marketing material to market your practice. Let's give you unlimited support, continuing education. Let's have a doctor on staff. When you have a lesion, you take a filter. So you put this on your smartphone. You snap a picture of the patient's mouth. Send us the lesion, and let's help you through it. So now we're, we have a monthly program that we support our offices from marketing efforts all the way to saving lives. And our offices are making money. They're marketing their practice better. 
And ultimately what our goal is, and hopefully everybody's goal is, we're able to change some lives by finding cancer early. That's really what our goal has been for, for the longevity of forward science. So then then you're really a teledentistry. Uh, I mean, well, you know, diagnosis always goes to you guys. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're the unlimited support. If they have a question, if you need anything, we're going to walk you through. And it's not that we're clinicians. It's that we're science-based and we've seen every case possibly. Uh, you know, we work with the top cancer center religiously on a lot of different research and studies. We know what people are looking at. We know the tissue is challenging to look under a new type of light. So let us help. You find a lesion, take a picture, send it to us. Let's walk you through what the thought process should be. Okay. And over time. Let, let, let's, let, let's go back to the oral ID. Um, you're, we're going through a lot of your process. So it's um, how much does that cost? How much is a starter kit? To tell me, tell me since, since, insurance not paying it is definitely money is the answer what's the question so yeah. my homies listening right now what is the um what is this cost um what are people uh, charging for it how, how does this work financially since at the end of the month my staff's going to want to get paid i'm going to have to pay my rent mortgage equipment build out computer insurance malpractice so how does this economically work talk yeah, mba so so typically in the past these devices cost between two and five thousand dollars up front and then every time you screen a patient, there's a $2.50 sheet. So the average office screens about 100 patients a month. That's $250 a month. So that's an upfront cost and an ongoing cost. And that's why dentistry wasn't going after a lot. You know, it's not cheap. So we said, hey, look, our goal is not just to sell a bunch of widgets and then to ride off in the sunset, right? We want to change lives and we want to truly make an impact on dentistry. So we said, hey, what if we just say no upfront cost? And instead of charging every time you screen a patient, what if we have a device that just charges you a low monthly fee so that now you don't have to worry about 250 bucks a month and then you screen 200 patients, now it's 500 bucks a month. So we now offer our, our device in a complete program. It's nothing up front, $200 a month, and that's it. You get a limited warranty, a limited CD credits. You get a lot of different social media signs. So when you're marketing this to your practice, you wanna hold up a sign that says 50 shades of oral cancer, Put it on Facebook, put it on social media, and let let your patients be your marketing. So typically our offices, if you look at the economics, they charge between $20 and $35 per screening. Again, it costs you $0, so that's $20, $35 profit. After the first day of hygiene, we typically see about a 75% acceptance. You've paid your monthly, you paid your monthly fee and you have 100 percent profit after that. So our offices are making between two and three thousand dollars per device in their office. Every hygienist, you know, puts it in their comp plan if that's something that offices do. If it's up to the bottom line for the office. It's two hundred and fifty a month? It's two hundred dollars a month. Two hundred dollars a month. Yeah. Most other devices are two fifty a month because the sheath is two fifty and then you know they screen hundred patients. Wow. And and how and what year did this come out? We launched in twenty thirteen, March twenty thirteen. We switched to our monthly program. We call it the ID for Life program. From the market demand uh you know the market wanted more support more marketing more literature and as a small business you can't just give stuff out for free started so, in what year 2013. and and, it, and instead of having you know the the i i think one of the biggest problems is you know um you know there's a statement of income a statement of cash flow a balance sheet um the business model of a monthly reoccurring revenue a reoccurring revenue model like Netflix um, is why Netflix almost had a valuation of Disney because Disney was that, you know, I've seen it in 30 years where, you know, a company would sell a laser for 50,000 and they'd yeah. sell a thousand of them and then they'd go bankrupt because yep. they had no reoccurring yeah. revenue. And you know I saw I it in dental software that the best dental software companies are ones that just charge you those to say, okay, we just want a hundred bucks a month. Because if all you guys are paying $100 a month, we can plan our payroll, our expansion, our bills. But if we sell you something really big one time, we're, we're, we're panicking because we, we, we don't know how to budget because we, we can't predict the future. So congratulations on converting to a reoccurring revenue model. Um, it's the obvious no-brainer business model. So, it's, so you uh, started this in 2013. It's 200 a month. Um, how popular or successful is that? It's now 2019. So six yeah, years, I mean, how many, how many dentists are doing this now? So in 2013, uh, we sold outright and we went that route. And then in, in 2015, we switched to the monthly model. So 
As far as worldwide, we, we do have a lot of offices worldwide that are using this. Third world countries obviously have a big opportunity to save some lives. But here in the U.S., we probably have four or 5,000 offices that have a device. Uh, we got our, our footprint in with some of the large groups that we work with. And, you know, DSOs are probably a whole other co topic of conversation that we can go over. But for them, they wanted to motivate their team, differentiate themselves, but also make some money. So, you know, if DSOs are doing it, then there's an opportunity for the revenue driving aspect to be there. So which, we had, which, which DSOs are doing it? So small brands came on board with it, within the first small brands. Okay. So they're right now, small brands, Monarch Castle, wherever you are, there's a different office. And then now we're working with, you know, some of the biggest groups in the nation, whether it's Aspen, Heartland, you know, we're working from office to office and then trying to work with corporate to figure out how we can impact their entire system. Um, so, you know, for them, they're, they're always looking at their initiatives and typically their initiatives are a year or two out. But from our end, we want to work with every single practice that's trying to do the right thing all the way up into, you know, big groups. And we don't, you know, we're agnostic to who we go for. We want patients get screened and wherever, whoever's screening patients, that's what we want to be in. And Smile Brands, uh, he was on, Steve Bilt, he's the CEO yep. and co-founder. He was episode 787. And I always tell these young dentists, you know, those, at the end of the day, they want to, most of them want to work for themselves. And they'll work for these guys with these, um, and, and they'll, they'll come out after a couple of years and I'll say, well, well, tell me, this guy's running several hundred offices. What did you learn from the business? They, they, they didn't, you know, they just did fillings and crowns. So when Steve Bilt is doing something like this, he figured out, how to charge money, pay sure. their overhead and, and that income. Cause if you don't make profit, you're no longer alive. So congratulations on Steve built. And, uh, but, but you haven't got, um, have you got, um, Heartland or Aspen or, um, um, Pacific? Yeah, we'll, work, we'll work with a lot of them regionally. So typically for them, you know, it's a two, three, two, three year process. We have some regional rollouts that we're working with, you know, for them, they have a lot of initiatives, whether it's lasers, whether it's another hygiene initiative. So, the fact that this can be put into hygiene and grow revenue, it's something that we're doing trials with, and we are working with all three of the ones you mentioned. Um, so again, I mean, if, for us, it's bandwidth. I mean, we need to be, be able to, to go as, to as many offices as we can and service everybody the same. And that's been our focus since day one. And and they want to do a pilot. I mean, um, it, so it's called the, the BB gun, the rifle, the cannon. And, um, you know, my favorite business book, who, who wrote that um, um, uh, Built to Last, um, Good to great. Was it Steve uh, Covey? Uh, no, was not Covey. Uh, um, I'm going to draw a blank. It's on, my, it's on my reading list somewhere around here. Um, uh, built to last um, was, um, oh my God. Jim Collins. I'm sorry, Jim. I'm sure you're not yeah. listening to this, but um, my four favorite business books of all time were all written by him. I mean, it was built to last, good to great. <laughs> How um how the mighty fall all that kind of stuff but but he, what he talks about is successful companies when they have an idea like say you're Aspen and you got 500 offices or 900 offices Heartland and well you just don't say oh we're gonna do this and do it because then you might go bankrupt so sure. what you do is you start with a BB gun you say well let's see if we can hit this and you'll take one office one region and you'll hit it and you'll shoot at it and you hit it you say wow that we're so now we're gonna load up and we're gonna go to a rifle. So now I'm going to try to shoot you with a rifle. And if that also works, then we're going to go ahead and load up and take a cannonball and hit everyone. And when you don't follow that recipe, you run out of cash. And when you study the 40 to 60,000 uh, bankruptcies that happen each year in the United States, a lot of them were profitable. They just ran out of cash because I, I just sold you something and you're not going to pay me for 90 days. Well, my bills are a dollar a month. I don't have $3 in savings to wait for you to give me $3 in 90 days. So you got a business and it was profitable. So the collection policy, um, what insurance, um, you know, um, collecting half down um, when you start and half before you see the crown. I mean, if, if you don't have your financial house on order, you should just call yourself Dr. Woulda, Shoulda, Coulda and prepare for bankruptcy today. Uh, so I love um, I love the fact that these guys are doing it um, in a way that would make uh, Jim Collins proud, and yep. they're testing it out regionally. So oral ID is is that your would you say that's your flagship product? Um, because um, I always think of you as Smile Max too. But what, what is your what is Ford Science flagship based yeah, product? Yeah, we, we we made our name from oral ID. So you know, early on, we would go to trade shows, and we only had one product. So. 
we would have World ID branded everywhere, and that's what we were known for. So when we launched Saliva Max, which is a prescription rinse for dry mouth, we had you know we had to rebrand a little bit. We had to put forward science really big on everything, and then our products underneath. And you know, that's just part for the course in business, and we're fine with that. So forward science has been you know what the company's been named since 2012, but we had to focus back to forward science in 2015 when we launched Saliva Max and say, hey, look, we have World ID which is an award-winning oral cancer screening device that's been on the market since 2013. We're also looking for an oral health rinse in Saliva Max that we're launching. So we have these two opportunities. We have some diagnostic tests, but you know, Saliva Max was our first introduction to the pharmaceutical world, and there's nothing on the market that actually treats both xerostomia and mucositis. You know, typically, the way that we come up with a product is we listen to a dentist and then a hygienist and then another dentist, and by the eighth time we hear something, we try to figure out how to make it. So people kept complaining about dry mouth and how biotin doesn't work and how it's acidic and all those things that we hear, but nobody had a solution for that problem. So, you know, my partner and I got to the lab and we said, Hey, what can we do? And you know, a year and a half later, we launched Saliva Max and it's been, it's been dentistry's biggest kept secret because people don't always understand how the prescription world works in dentistry, but it's one of the only products that actually treats both xerostomia and mucositis. And the fact that you can treat both of those, I mean, it's it's a game changer for an oncology patient, for a medication-induced xerostomic patient, and anybody else that just has minor xerostomia, which you know, unfortunately is half the population nowadays. So, um, yeah, xerostomia is so huge because we have the fastest growing population is the over 65, and by the time uh, they're on five different medications, they have polyphagia going on, and they're they're miserable. And um, it's hard for a young um, dentist to, to realize how painful that can be. I mean, even when you eat food, it doesn't even taste right if you don't have saliva. So, so if oral, I, um, if oral ID is your flagship product and, um, what would be your second? I mean, you got site ID, path ID, HPV ID, PHID, BioRed, Saliva Max, Saliva Kings, uh, so, yeah, instead we, of a, what, what would be your next, uh, uh we classify, I mean, we, we kind of classify what we're doing here in kind of a few categories. One, we have the devices, which is, is oral ID initially for early screening. We have the diagnostics and that's an entire category. So part of our program that we talked about earlier with oral ID, you get all of those diagnostics for free. So whether it's site ID, which is a liquid based cytology, path ID, which is a biopsy kit, HPV ID is a, an HPV test and pH ID is pH strips for to test the mouth for their acidity level. All of those come for free with our program because we know if you find a lesion, you're gonna to need to diagnose it. However you wanna diagnose it, we have the option for you. So that kind of all lumps together. And then we have our therapeutics. And our therapeutics are Saliva Max, um, Cidavig, and we're launching you know, another one, hopefully here in the next six months for another therapeutic. So that's our therapeutics. It's our prescription rinse line that we have dentistry has the option to you know, prescribe something that's been clinically proven and it's more of the therapeutic prescription world. Um, okay, so, so I, let, me, let me get that. So screen, so oral ID is screening. Yeah. And then what did you call the uh, the, the next? Diagnostic. Diagnostic, yeah, the diagnostic. diagnostic have, what? Diagnostic tests. Diagnostic so test. Have, and that screening, one. diagnostics, and then therapeutics. Okay, therapeutics, okay. Um, sorry, my That's, walnut brain works. And so, so your therapeutics are going to be, um, saliva max. well, bio, bio red, um, would saliva max be the first one you talk about there or? Yeah. So saliva max and saliva cane, saliva max is a prescription rinse for dry mouth. Saliva cane helps patients. It's a 5% benzocaine rinse. It helps the patients that are going through oncology treatment to get through that first week of mucositis pain while they're using saliva max to treat it. Um, and Cidavig is a one and done cold sore medication that we launched about a year ago. Um, it's a time release of cyclovir, so it's been clinically proven, and now you don't have to worry about the systemic issues with, with the cyclovir. Um, BioRed is, is just kind of a third outlier that we have, or a fourth outlier that we have, which is a, a mail back medical waste service because I'm sure everybody loves that Stericycle's got them in a contract. So BioRed was something that we launched for the dental industry just for a mail order service for sharps and medical waste. Um, I got to tell you, my, um, you know, dentistry really started getting, you know, it's probably first big um, technology was addressing pain with Novocaine. Yep. But uh, I don't think um, people remember the history. It started out with cocaine. 
And, um, and then you had the obvious problems with cocaine. Do you realize when I was in dental school and you had oral cancer and you couldn't eat or anything like that, they had aerosol cans of 99.999% um, cocaine. And it was just a lifesaver. I mean, these, these patients, they couldn't swallow, they had radiation burns, they wanted to kill themselves. And then you had other doctors saying, well, you can't give them that, they might get addicted. That's like, dude, they wanna kill themselves. So and you're worried about something less than killing themselves, you know, um, and uh, my gosh, it was uh, it was the most stolen can uh, in Missouri. That's all I'm going to say. Oh, that, uh, we'll, we'll end it there. But um, so. Um, so, yeah, so it was um, crazy. Uh, so um, so that's the light of the cane. And then you also have a Cidavig. Cidavig, yeah. So it's a. It's a time release of cyclovir tablet. So you put it, uh, it's a bulk of adhesive tablet, put it on, uh, put it in your mouth. And once you feel the tingling, it prevents a ton of cold sores. It delays the onset of the next cold sore. It's been a product that was launched in the, the dermatology world for a long time. And dentistry is, you know, typically looking at over the counter medication or an ointment for after the fact treatment. This, if you catch it in the prodrome phase, a third of the time, it doesn't even erupt. So it's truly something that dentistry can benefit from, but you know, it goes back to education is the key for everything we do. And we just need to get in front of more people to educate what we're doing. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. There's a lot of, um, a lot of young kids that just got out of dental school or maybe they're in dental school and they're seeing their first patient and they sit down and Robert Whitman is in for a cleaning or a filling and he's got a big cold sore and they know that cold sore is a uh, herpes labialis. Um, do you think that, uh, talk about that. Is, do you think the dentist already has that? Um, is it contagious? Talk, talk, talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times people don't know how to have the conversation. Just right. like HP, you know, people don't know how to sit down and it, I'm big on facts. If you educate and say facts, then it's not a I feel, you feel conversation. It's a, here's the facts about what you have. I mean, herpes is not something that's crazy uncommon. It's induced from some factor and whether it's stress or whatever they have going on. Um, but Cidavig is something that can help. And it's not just after it's erupted. It's you need this product for next time that you feel the tingling. You don't have time to call me and go get it filled. You need the prescription right now with you at all times so that if you do start to feel the tingling, use the tablet. And then now a third of the time, it won't even erupt. And if it does erupt, it's way less severe than typically what you're seeing. So, you know, again, I think prevention is what we're all about at Forward Science. And we want to prevent these bigger issues and, Cinebig fit perfectly in our portfolio with preventing these these massive cold sores that people are so embarrassed about. Well, back to her question though, she's wondering, should I reschedule this patient? I mean, um, so like like I'm I'll be 57 in two weeks. I've never had a cold sore. Um, I was never afraid to work on a patient with a cold sore. I was never afraid to uh, uh, you know kiss someone in my family that had a cold sore. So so what um, um it says um prevalence. Um, of herpes simplex virus type 1 HSV1 uh, was 47.8% and of herpes simplex type 2, 11.9% um, from the CDC. Uh, do you like those numbers from the CDC? Yeah, CDC is typically who we go for with, with data. No offense to the ADA, but CDC is a little more up to date. So if, so if you've never had a cold sore and Robert shows up for a cleaning and he's sporting a big old um, cold sore, would you do it anyway? Would you reschedule? What, what would you do? I mean, you, you know this stuff at a different level than any of my homies listening. Yeah, I mean, I think that goes back to the clinician themselves and how they practice. I think a lot of clinicians are going to treat the patient and, and look at convenience and they may go ahead and, and do whatever they need to do today. And then you have the other half of them that are going to say, you know what, can you please reschedule? So that's always the clinician to clinician. I, you know, I'm not a clinician, so I never had to make that decision. But uh, if you've never had a cold sore before, the odds of you having a cold sore at, at later on in your life, it's not common. You know, I've never suffered from a cold sore, so the odds of me getting a cold sore from someone that has one is pretty slim. But if I am a cold sore carrier and then and somebody else does have it, yeah, my odds may be more, more likely to get it. But there's a lot of other factors that go in than just you know, looking or practicing on someone with a cold sore. Just like an HPV lesion, people think that, you know, how do I treat this patient with an HPV lesion? Or we work, a good example here is we work with an HIV clinic here in Houston. And, you know, the HIV patient has something that people are worried about a lot. And you don't treat these patients any differently. You see the same patient and you make sure you treat them the same way and things are going to be fine. So 
Um, I think just typical precaution measures in an office are typically where people are going to lean towards. So, um, what what are the what are the takeaways? What what should my homies be doing um, with forward science? I mean, um, what, what what do you think the first step? I, I think the first step is I think you should do that um, sex. Um, what is it? Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Did I get sex, that right? Sex, drugs, and oral cancer. Oh, yeah. I thought. Oh, I was always doing sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> that, that's where I messed up. I, I wish you'd make an online CE course on that on Dental Town. Let me know. I'm happy to do it. I'm Howard. Uh, I was the first Howard at Dental Town, so I'm Howard at DentalTown.com. Shoot me an email if you have any thoughts or shows or leave uh, comments under the YouTube section. Um, but who does all the online CE is Howard Goldstein. So he's Hogo, H-O-G-O at okay. dentaltown.com. And uh, Sex, Drugs, and Oral Cancer by uh, Robert Whitman, MSC, founder of Ford Science. That would be... So So in, in a recap, how, how would you... Um, how would you... Um, what, what are the takeaway summaries? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing is get educated. You know, whether it's from us, whether it's from wherever else, we do have some online courses on our own, and I'd love to put them on your platform. So learn more about oral cancer, who's at risk, who's the people you need to screen. Unfortunately, it's everyone. Um, and then on top of that, you know, make sure that you use adjunctive technology. Uh, we'd love everybody to try out oral ID. It's, you know, again, no upfront costs. It's simple, easy to use. And if you don't like it in 30 days, send it back. And the fact that people can try a device, A, see how they like it clinically, and B, make some money while you do it, I mean, that's that's the perfect scenario for a dental provider to make money while they're saving lives. And if, if you don't see the benefit in that, then we probably have other issues. Um, and then have the conversation with your patients. You know, I think a lot of people are afraid of having an open conversation, but in today's world, they want transparency. You know, your patients want to know about HPV and oral cancer, and they're reading about it somewhere else, and it's probably incorrect. You have to be the bearer of information. And, you know, some of our brochures that we give out to our offices are, you know, we say it blatantly, sex, drugs, and oral cancer. So, okay, okay. But, but I, I mean, today on the news, um, even very conservative Christian evangelicals, they're, they're mad at Trump on his last deal, not for any policy thing he said, but because he took the Lord's name in vain three times during the show, and, and it's exploding. And when I, when I, when you go to Dentaltown and you just drop in the keyword um, HPV um, or, or oral cancer, all the threads are talking about, these dentists are saying, um, it's it, they're, they're not going to talk about that. It's not going to happen. So this is our country and it's a very, very conservative country. So how, how are you going to get, us, let us talk for you is, is well, you know, part of the reason we switched to this elaborate program is let us market for you. Let us give you these social signs that you're putting up that says, you know, F oral cancer so that you put it on social media and they call you for that. Or, you know, in last April, we launched a lips campaign so it's called Kiss Oral Cancer Goodbye. People are taking pictures of these lips, put it on social media. Nobody knows what the lips mean, but when they show up in your office and you say that meant Kiss Oral Cancer Goodbye, now- Hold, the hold those lips up again. So if you watch this on YouTube, if those lips had a cold sore, would you kiss them? <laughs> I'm uh, I'm going with yes, um, no no problem. Well, um, ask you, Howard, which color is your favorite color? You got you know pink, purple, and we have a million other colors that we choose from. Well, mine's purple, and when I told uh, my granddaughter it was pink, she said it couldn't be pink because I was a boy. And so we <laughs> agreed that hers was pink and mine was purple. But there's a threat on Dental Town. HPV vaccine discussion with dentists. And um, somebody, um, the, the first post, uh, hell to the no, to the no, no, no. And I mean, this is, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to do it. So, so you're going to help them. And, and you know, Elvis Presley, I, I, I really admired him because I was born in 62 in Kansas and my mom, my gosh, she loved, she had everything Elvis did, the Beatles did and the Glenn Miller orchestra. And uh, that's what I grew up on. And in 1956, Elvis Presley got a polio vaccination live on national TV. The one event was partly responsible for raising immunization levels in the United States from 0.6% to 80% in six oh. months. That's how big Elvis is. I mean, Elvis is in the house. And where are, you know, the, the, this deal where, um, who's going to be the HPV Gardasil? Who's going to be the Elvis in the house with HPV? Was it Michael Douglas? Is he even running for it? Was, wasn't there rumors about some quarterback for the Buffalo Bills? Yeah, so Jim Kelly's had oral cancer and he's on his third spout now and he moved part of his jaw and, 
you know, I, and, and it, it, for him, it was tobacco use. So I think the challenge is who's going to be the next Elvis? Nobody, because everybody's ashamed about it. So we have to beat it to the punch and say, look, you know, let's not wait for you to be the poster child. Let's make sure that we're doing everything we can for our patients. And that's screening. It's a two minute exam. You, some offices want to talk about HPV, some don't. Call it an oral health assessment. Don't say the word HPV or oral cancer. I'm a transparent person, and I'm probably going to ask them questions about, you know, if you're six or more oral sexual partners, you're 8.6 times more likely to get oral cancer. Some people ask the question of how many oral sex partners have you had. Some don't. To each his own. But however you do it in your office will help you with that questionnaire, the risk assessment survey, the verbiage. Let us be your guidance on that, but do something. You know, we're... Ulysses S. Grant died a long time ago from oral cancer. And the same way Ulysses S. Grant is being screened is the same way we're screening today. And for me, that's just not, that's not acceptable in a, in a disease that is very, very easily treated if we find it early, but we're just not finding it early enough. That, that is amazing. And what's, um, I really enjoyed this study a while back. It was showing that, um, you know, a lot of these countries, they just start vaccinating women first. And then the, the first studies that came out long term is the boys were benefiting from it because they didn't get the vaccine, but now the girls they're kissing uh, don't have it. And it's all her disease. And no, no one wants to talk about her disease. Every time some child is taken to the OR to be put down to have a bunch of pulpotomies and crumb still crowns and they, and they don't come out of the procedure and the horrible thing happens, the media never addresses, why did that two-year-old need eight root canals? Yeah. Talk about her disease. She's living in a barn with a bunch of people that have blown out decay everywhere and they're all sharing spoons and kissing and hugging and playing. And, and, uh, so, so the first we, significant data we really have on HPV vaccines is when you gave it to all the girls, the boys didn't get it. So yep. why have you seen Margaret every three months for periodontal disease for the last five years? And you don't even know who her husband is. Uh, do they have a plutonic marriage with three kids where their children conceived at Tulane University in a Petri dish? I mean, it, it, it's a herd disease. Um, yep. So you're, uh, you're the smartest man I know on this subject. You have two children, uh, two of how many? What's, what's the plan on this? Oh man, we're uh, we're in Houston, Texas, and our family's in New Orleans, so we're gonna stick with two right now for our sanity. But we'll we're figuring out here shortly. And when will you give them the HPV vaccine? And have you and your wife had had it? And would it still just be only Gardasil nine by Merck? So no, I mean there's more Gardasil shots now, and there's a few other companies that have it. The good thing is the the vaccines advanced enough where it doesn't protect just against sixteen and eighteen which caused the majority of cervical and oral cancer. It's way more than that. So it's about six or seven types now. Um, I didn't have the luxury of having it more than my wife because it didn't come out in time. You have to get it before you've been infected with HPV. So the Gardasil team actually approves it. Merck approves it for nine-year-old boys and girls um, because if you get it before you become sexually active, then more likely you haven't had HPV yet. But if you get the vaccine when you're 18 and you've already been infected with HPV, then the vaccine doesn't work. So that's why they recommend nine-year-old boys and girls. And yeah, my wife, again, she's an ER nurse. She's very well medically trained, way more than me. And unfortunately, from the world that we live in, knowing too much information isn't good. We're, we're most likely going to vaccinate our kids when the time comes. And when do you think, um, well, well, basically, I, I want to say something else. Um, it's, it's called the value chain. And when, when I grew up with my dad, I mean, you know, when he had Sonny drive-ins, um, he was on, he was on equal footing with his value chains, the meat man, the, the, you know, the produce, everything. And, and everybody worked together to serve a hamburger to their common customer. And dentists have been so abusive and holier than thou, um, that the dental societies, um, you know, the, um, that, that, I mean, like the California Dental Societies would have uh, lectures by Bill Dickerson called Delta um, Insurance or the Devil. And Delta's like, really? You're bringing in a speaker that's referring to me as a devil and we sold a billion dollars of dental insurance in your state, you Cretan morons. And that, that I mean, I mean the, the, so, so the, we're paying the price yep. for, the, for the arrogance that we've treated Delta Dental and, and then, and then you wondered why they, they snap back at you. Um, your state dental societies, um, I, um, and the American dental society, um, they, they got a bunch of relationship repair they got to do. 
Um, and then uh, Delta Dental. I mean, the, the average Delta Dental guy in a, in a state will probably give some dentist a hundred grand a year. And that dentist couldn't even pick that guy out of a police lineup, never sent him a gift, never sent him cookies, never, t- you know, because I'm a dentist and you're yeah. not. And then the state board of dental examiners. I mean, you want to get permission to give a uh, flu shot or um, or any of this uh, new technology, but you know they've only met you twice, and both times you walked in there with a the lawyer cussing and screaming. I mean, <laughs> when when is dentist going to figure out that they're part of this very complex dental value chain? Yeah, I think it's the flight, the fight or flight mentality. You know, I mean, you're most dentists are running their own practice, and you got to scrape for every dollar and. It's tough, just to your point earlier about why forward science is looking at a long haul picture because we want to do the right thing today. And yeah, we could probably do more financially today, but I want to, you know, I want to be here in 10 years. I want to make sure that we can service the products that we're offering with our offices. So I think a lot of times people look at the small picture, not the big picture, Um, you know, run the value proposition to taking insurance versus not. If you offer this screening, yeah, 20, 30% of them do get covered. So try that. But if it doesn't get covered, then tell your patient, hey, your insurance didn't cover this. It's going to be $20 out of pocket. You charge for a copay for a pap smear or mammogram, $20, $30. Patients are willing to pay for services if they understand it. For me personally, I pay my dentist $65 for a screening, and he educates me everything that I told him to say. He says, and he pretty much guilts me into paying it because I have to, because I, I can't say no. So if you educate properly, I think it goes a long way. But you know, depending on insurance, is it's tough these days, but to your point, they're not the devil. It's just understand what their value is, use that value, and then go elsewhere if you need more value. Well, I think, you know, um, the reason Dentaltown Online CE has been, you know, such a huge hit, we, we have 400 courses they've been viewed a million times because it's succinct to an hour. It's perfect for a staff meeting. Instead of flying your staff and putting them in hotels and closing down business for a day. You can just keep them on the payroll, order a pizza for, for lunch and watch one of these courses. I'd love for you to do a one hour lunch course on uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and what the hell is oral cancer. Um, I, I wanna finish this, the last um, um, question with, um, how do you metric success for oral IED? I mean, if you were, you know, how, what is your metric? How do you metric success for this? I mean, it's tough. Ultimately, or for one, I'll say this, having having your kid have a device in the bathtub and seeing the whole tub light up blue is always a success. But, um, you know, I think typically people look at success as how much money you're making or how many offices that are using your device. We look at it from the patient standpoint. You know, how many lives can we truly affect and how many lives can we change because we didn't just sell a device. We had an office use our device on every patient that walked in the door and those stories that we get back from offices that say, hey, without your device, or without your CE course, without this technology, I would have missed this lesion. And who knows what would have happened to Miss Smith? I mean, that's the ultimate pinnacle for us. You know, whether it's five devices or 100 million devices, I don't, I don't care. If nobody uses them, then what's the point of, of making this great technology? So we metric our success in life saved. And the fact that we can actually do that is, is pretty grounding. And, you know, um, to my young homies out there, I love the what excites me the most about this podcast, and why I'm not going to stop doing it while you guys are still consuming it, is the fact that um my my gosh, you're you're the next generation. I mean, we're about to fade away. You guys are going to replace us. And when I was your age, um, look how marginalized uh, gay people were, and now now they legally get married. They're not they're no longer marginalized. So you young dentist, you're going to go take a job for some conservative dentist, and he's not going to talk about any of these things and real people are going to die and you're a millennial you have to man up woman up homo sapien up and education is the key and if you young dentists and hygienists out there can't look a patient in the eye um, and talk about um, sex drugs and oral cancer then that means your decision of what was culturally appropriate um, we'll end with this person going to die. I mean, I already know people who got their teeth cleaned every six months, went to ASU, got oral pharyngeal cancer, and they're no longer here. And I always think to myself, um, that little girl saw a dentist every six months in the same office since she was two years old, and he was a board-certified pediatric dentist. I mean, I mean, and she's dead. We didn't do her job. I mean, 
Um, what would you do if the fireman said, well, you know what? I just don't really want to go to a house on fire. I don't find people are running out of the house naked and they were sleeping. You know, it's just not appropriate. Come on, millennials, man up. Talk yeah. about sex, drugs, and oral cancer. And um, Robert, it was just an honor for you to come on the show today. Um, thanks so much for coming on. And hopefully uh, in your career, you can see us finally make the corner and start being physicians of the oral mouth and not molar mechanics. Thank you so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. We appreciate it. Keep doing great work. All right, buddy. Bye-bye.